Uh, and first, I, I think I kind of need to make an apology in, in a way because um, my, my photographs really don't help anyone. <clears throat> and there's been a lot of discussion uh, here about the importance of photography making a difference, um, you know, sparking a greater social awareness, maybe even causing positive social change. Um, I, I mean, I'm pretty progressive in my thinking, and I like to think I do that in other ways, but I don't uh, do it with my photographs. I, I mean, they're pretty much pure self-expression, and um, they really don't do anything for anyone except perhaps on an in individual basis. You know, I hope that, that, you know, in doing them, I'm sharing some kind of um, beauty with them or an interest in something that they ordinarily you know, might not have seen. I mean, I'm not interested in doing pictures of beautiful mountain ranges because those are avowedly beautiful. And, um, on the, you know, I'm interested in kind of saying, here's something that you might not have considered uh, that's interesting or beautiful, and you might not have looked at it this way, that way before. And, you know, I guess that's sort of the definition of fine art photography, which is really what I do. I should explain that uh, though I was um, editor at American Photo for about a quarter century, hard to believe, that's like an eternity, I didn't, I didn't come there from a photojournalism background, uh, or a journalism background, I should say. Um, I did, you know, English and art, uh, and, but then ended up getting a, a BFA at the museum school in Boston, um, doing painting, drawing, printmaking, especially, and um, so photography was just an extension of all those different media. It was just kind of one, you know, one way that I was sort of pursuing this idea of self-expression. Um, the difference was that photography uh, was the only medium of the ones I was using that allowed the possibility of making a, you know, a living and making money, at least at that time in the 1970s. And um, so I ended up working as an editorial and advertising photographer in Boston for about 10 years. Uh, I did uh, portraits for Boston Magazine, which was the big city magazine. I did uh, advertising assignments for Polaroid, which was based in Boston. I did uh, studio work for the Museum of Fine Arts, you know, shooting art, art and sculpture and stuff. Um, and I have to say that I probably learned more about photography from that work than I actually did in art school. Um, particularly at that time when the school that I went to was almost sort of anti-technique. I mean, it was more about uh, the aesthetic side of things. Um, and then when I was offered a job at Popular Photography initially, um, I stopped doing freelance work pretty, um, more or less, I did a little bit, and then I stopped also doing a lot of my own creative work because the job was just, you know, so demanding. Um, and in the last four or five years since leaving the magazine, I've had, I've been able to create the space to, you know, to pick it up again. But it's changed, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, you know, the ways in which it's changed, um, changed for me, you know, particularly with the advent of digital. So when John and I, John Isaac, um, our old friends, and we arrived in Delhi several days ago, um, and I had just part of a day to look around, he took me to the, um, what is it, the Jama, the Jama Mosque, Jama Mas Masjid, is that it? Um, and, you know, while he was taking these beautiful pictures of little kids rolling around on the, you know, on the plaza and, you know, people praying and other things, I, I had to find some sort of, um, you know, more formal thing going on there because that's just the way I think. I mean, John and I are about as different as photographers can be, interestingly. Uh, and it's sort of harder for me to take pictures, I think, than it is for John. I, I tend to, um, you know, I, I tend to be a low volume shooter. I mean, I don't uh, shoot a lot of pictures. Um, I tend to, when I find something that really interests me, I tend to work it, shoot it in different ways. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, Frankly, I, I have made the mistake over the years of talking myself out of pictures. I, I, uh, it's not a good, good way to work because, you know, over the years there are probably a lot of pictures I should have taken that would have been good, but that I somehow convinced myself, you know, before I took them that now I'll never print that or that's not going to be good. 
not a good way to work, and that sort of hamstrung me for a long time. And that's something that digital really kind of cured me of, that, that, that bad, very bad habit, because it's just so easy to take pictures with, with digital. Um, let me move along here. Picture of John here showing, uh, this is when we were in Puerto Rico. Uh, I, you know, when we were there, I tried to make myself shoot more the way he does. I could do it, um, but it just, it's just not me. I put, I put the pictures on, on my Facebook page because they're different than other things I've done. And, and um, I mean, they're okay, but they're just not the kind of pictures that I would normally go out and make. We happen to be on an Olympus editorial trip in this case, and I had to shoot with this new camera. So it sort of forced my hand. Um, but, you know, I have to say that, um, I'll tell you the story about this in a minute. Um, having been at the magazine for so long, I really came to understand that photography can be all things to all people. I mean, it really it can take so many different forms. Uh, you know, we come in so many different genres, have so many different purposes, styles, and so forth, that frankly, it just continues to amaze me just how many, how many, uh, you know, iterations of photography there continue to be. Um, so when a mother raccoon took up residence in a big hole in a tree in my backyard, I immediately called John uh, because he's the wildlife photographer, not me, and he lives fairly close to me, just north of New York City. Um, you know, I thought, here's a great wildlife opportunity in your own backyard, literally my backyard. Um, and he came over with his big telephoto lens and you know, I don't even own a lens long enough for a shot like this. And we set his camera up on the back porch. And um, I, told, I told him that there were two babies in the hole with the mom. And that every day the mom would come home in the morning and she would just literally lie out of the hole, sort of upside down like this, you know, with her, usually with her legs hanging out too, um, in a state of, apparently a state of complete exhaustion. So that was pretty cool. And then her, the two babies that I could see would jump all over her, chew her ears and all of that, and she wouldn't even respond because she was so tired. So we started, John and I started making a lot of racket to try to get the babies to come out. And one head popped up, and then two head pops up, and then a third head popped up. I didn't know there were three pups in there. And uh, John took the picture, this John's picture. And after that, we high-fived each other because we knew it was going to be just an adorable picture, you know. But again, I had to call John to take this picture. It's just not, it's not me. So, you know, we, John mentioned that I think that he and I had gone to uh, Mississippi last April um, to see kind of old, you know, sites of American blues, including Elvis's home Graceland, which um, John had always wanted to see. And, uh, you know, we both took pictures all over Mississippi, but again, they were as different as, as pictures could be. Um, and, and, you know, for me, that really is, um, you know, it really is the beauty of the medium. Uh, you can take the exact same subject and have two photographers shoot it, and it's, it's um, wor and there's worlds of difference. Um, so when I was at uh, American Photo, um, I, I really was sort of a businessman. My daughter depicted me here as a businessman, as you can see. Uh, I mean, I happen to be having surgery, but um, uh, it, 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 the business was to produce a magazine about um, photography and visual culture, not so much a how-to. Um, journalism, not a practical magazine. Um, and, you know, involved writing stories about photographers like John. Uh, and it, but it took really most of my time and energy and I was, you know, able to do a little bit of photography on vacation and other things, but um, it never seemed enough time to really make a lot of progress as a visual artist. So again, the last few years have been a chance in a sense for me to reinvent myself as a photographer. Um, the, these are some examples of work I did on film before I switched to digital. Um, it's infrared film, and now I shoot digital infrared. Uh, you, you may know that infrared uh, is radiation, electromagnetic radiation. You can't actually say infrared light because it's not light, 
but it's rays of, it's, it's electromagnetic rays that are right off the red end of the visible spectrum of light. And it records the film, in this case the film, uh, records that radiation. I, the way I used it, I also let in some uh, visible light because I didn't want uh, this kind of sort of typical effect that's associated with infrared film of a very high contrast, you know, super bright white, super dark dark kind of effect. I wanted something with more mid-tones, so I, in this case, for example, used a red filter on the camera um, instead of an infrared filter, and that let, you know, a lot of visible light in to kind of mitigate the effect. Um, but what appealed to me about um, infrared film um, well, for, first of all, I, I mean, I started using it really because I've never been a, a, a realist. I, I, I'm not interested in realism in photography, even though I love to look at, at realistic photographs. Um, I, uh, I just can't, I can't make those kinds of pictures. Um, and, um, you know, wildlife, uh, people, I just, I just don't want to do it myself because they're other people, other photographers who do them tremendously well. Um, and I like the way infrared um, uh, sort of inverted the normal tonal relationships <clears throat> of a, you know, a landscape. Uh, and not so much in this image. I mean, this was taken more on an overcast day. Uh, I'll tell you where these were, just if we want to know. This is a Daytona Beach in Florida where they had a, uh, big amusement pier that stuck out into the ocean and um, there was a ride, a gondola ride that went all the way out to the end of the pier and curved around and it was getting very late in the day and I knew I wanted to take a picture on it so I drove, you know, drove there, got out, hopped on the ride and snapped this as I was going the other way from this couple. This was kind of a grab shot compared to the way I usually work um, but it was a grab shot that, you know, that worked out well for me because as with all my pictures, you know, I want, you know, it to be more than just a picture of the, th the main thing, you know, I like these little cars back here in this little row of walking figures and so forth. And, um, and you know, I'll talk about this a little bit, in a little bit, but, um, you know, my pictures are kind of about human occupation of the landscape. I mean, if, if you could describe them in any way, they're landscapes that are occupied. Um, <clears throat> so, this is at the uh, Salton Sea, which is a very strange kind of defunct resort area in Southern California. Um, but you may know that if you filter it in a certain way, infrared turns the sky dark, it turns foliage light, um, and it, but it does this inversion without really creating just kind of a negative. It's not like a negative image, it's more complex than that. But the inversion, this sort of inversion of dark and light, a lot, you know, let me play with the space of the image. I mean, here, for example, I deliberately <clears throat> lined up the tops of these funny walls, these freestanding walls with the ocean horizon there because I wanted the picture to be flat. Now, if you were a normal photographer trying to represent this in a three-dimensional way, you'd shoot from a higher perspective to kind of separate those, those two wings from from the horizon, you know, so that they'd be below the horizon and you'd have literally vertical space between them on the plane of the picture. Um, in this case, I, I, I kind of hunkered down and shot them just so they would line up with that uh, ocean horizon. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, modernist critics like to talk about uh, the picture plane, you know, and with paintings, you know, this you know, that everything is happening on the picture plane. They fl an artist flattens the picture plane. This is about flattening the picture plane, I guess. Um, I'm not trying to create a realistic, literal uh, sort of space. Um, this is Miami Beach, a little swing set that they kept from sinking into the sand by putting news newspapers underneath the legs. But, you know, we talked about this in our workshop a little bit about the idea of shooting by, uh, Finding something kind of a basic thing or a basic setting that 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 you think has potential that appeals to you. I mean, in this case, this structure itself created this very cool kind of double arrow shadow on the bottom and the newspaper holding it. 
So I waited there. I have probably a whole roll of this with people popping up over the horizon, you know, and filling the little spaces in between, uh, you know, the, the bars of the swing set. And, you know, this was the one that worked out best with the two guys and then the guy in the middle. <clears throat> um, that band in the middle of this is ocean. Um, and, but I didn't want it to look like ocean. I just wanted it to be a dark band in the middle of the picture. This was originally, um, when I started shooting infrared, I actually shot it in stereo. I made stereo pairs that were designed to be viewed in an old uh, stereo Opticon viewer, you know, the 3D viewers. Um, and then I decided that 3D and infrared was sort of too much. And so I just started doing single frame infrared, but this was originally part of a stereo pair you know, in which the depth, you know, the, the, the kind of inverted, that closed line in the back was really, really uh, had a lot of depth, really was receding away from the closed line in the foreground. But I realized that I didn't need that effect to kind of achieve what I wanted to. Um, this is an example of how the scale of things, I mean, these are those really massive, um, uh, you know, windmills used for generating electrical power. They have whole fields of them in California. So these are like, I don't know, like 75, 100 feet high. But, um, you know, with this, and there was a big reservoir in the foreground. I shot with a red filter. It turned the, the reservoir almost black. Um, the sky was dark. And, uh, you know, because they were far away and there's no other cue to, de cue to, the, to their scale, um, they kind of read as little, almost like little flowers or something. I mean, this is a pretty minimal image by my standards, but it's interesting when I scanned these images to make digital prints for the first time, uh, it completely pulled detail out of this negative that had just, when I printed it optically, had never been there. In other words, I, when I printed it optically, that uh, water just went black and I knew it would. But when I did a digital scan and made a digital print from it, there was all kinds of wave activity in that black band of water in the bottom. I literally had to darken, uh, you know, that that reservoir uh, to kind of make the digital print match the optical print that I had made before. I mean, this is a case where kind of what I was doing in terms of flattening and kind of anticipating the effects of infrared really kind of worked out for the first time. I mean, infrared, uh, you know the term pre-visualization, which you know, was sort of one of Ansel Adams' ideas. With infrared, it's a little tough to pre-visualize because it's not, um, it's not recording visible light, but in this case, having worked with it long enough, I understood that because of the way the light was, was kind of striking these hooks, which were screwed into a board, the sort of opposite side of a clothesline structure, I knew that the hooks would sort of float in space and then recede all the way uh, to the horizon in the, in the background. In this case, you know, I took the middle bar of that railing and lined it up with the ocean. That little black band on the right is actually the ocean horizon. It's pretty, it's pretty austere stuff. It's not everybody's cup of tea. I realize it's, uh, uh, some people, I remember, um, I showed some of these pictures to a gallerist in, in Boston early on, and I probably should have known better because this was a guy known for sort of showing the rocks and ferns school of photography. And uh, he looked at the pictures and said, these pictures don't say come in. Uh, in other words, he didn't find them inviting. They didn't uh, make him want to be there. For me, and, and that was an interesting thing he said because I love to look at pictures that make me want to be there, you know, that are just pictures of beautiful places, but again, I don't want to make those pictures. Um, I want to make a picture that makes you kind of wonder what it is, maybe even not want to be there, but, um, you know, raise some kind of, create some kind of mystery around the thing that I'm uh, photographing. This is kind of an interesting consequence of the infrared. The sun was coming in really low uh, from the right, and because the sky gets darker, gets lighter toward the horizon because it's less blue when you use a red filter, it creates almost a false light on the horizon. So you've got kind of light coming in from the front and side, and then it's like there's light behind the horizon too. It almost has like a Hollywood sort of 
um, look to it. <clears throat> this is in um, uh, Hollywood Beach in Florida. Um, you know, the dark sky uh, lets me make or allowed me to make uh, light thing, lighter things stand out against it um, and, uh, you know, kind of hide things in it. Um, again, the alignment of different elements kind of allowed, you know, kind of enhanced that. Uh, this was a municipal swimming pool in Scotland near Edinburgh that was actually fed by the North Sea. Not a place you would want to swim. Very cold. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I guess y you might be able to see by now that even though these are nominally landscape pictures, um, they're landscapes that are, you know, that have been heavily altered by humans. And that's really what interests me in terms of landscape. I'm not, I haven't been particularly interested in, in doing pure natural landscapes, although, uh, as I'll explain, um, when I started shooting digital infrared, I started being more open to the possibility of pure landscapes than these. Um, but, uh, you know, in some of the pictures, the, the kind of um, balance tilts toward human, and some of them it tilts toward nature. And, you know, this dynamic, that dynamic, kind of an overriding part of, of um, modern life and, you know, as, as human um, enterprise continues to kind of intrude into the natural world and overtake you know, all of these landscapes. Um, but I think um, <clears throat> this was in, uh, this was in Nova Scotia. Shot it from a low angle so that the laundry would be up against the sky and stand out above the house. Um, you know, I'm interested, I think, in uh, these things that, um, I mean, here it's a, a recreational thing rather than kind of a, a, a fun work or functional thing. This was a volleyball net that had been left on a New Jersey beach in the winter. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, so, you know, I like the angularity of things like this, I, I, but I, it, it's sort of the, it, what appeals to me partly is that there are these things that have been left there that have kind of lost their sense of purpose, you know, and they're kind of, to me, a little forlorn and lonely and, um, uh, you know, they've kind of lost their, uh, their utility. This was a, an armature for a mushroom sculpture that was part of a kind of fantasy miniature golf course. And it was just sitting in the middle of the desert. The golf course had never been completed. Uh, and, you know, this is one of those things that occurs to you or that you realize after the fact, but, you know, you've got a mushroom in the foreground and then kind of a mushroom cloud in the background. Um, a happy accident. Um, this was a roller for uh, baling hay, and I shot this with 4x5 <coughs> infrared, actually. Infrared was a film was just a really, really kind of um, uh, uh, finicky material. And infra inf interestingly, infrared and digital is also quite problematic. I'll tell you a little bit about that, too. Um, but uh, in this case, I kind of, even though I was going for a more full-toned you know, less dramatic effect. I, I sort of deliberately wanted the top of the roller to get lost in the shadows of the trees in the background, just to sort of flatten out the, the space between the, between this, uh, you know, this uh, sculpture sort of and the, and the, the horizon. <clears throat> this was a, um, these were the pylons for a hotel on the, Florida Gulf Coast that was never built, but sort of struck me as almost like a weird kind of cemetery. Um, again, four by five infrared rather than 35. <clears throat> um, and here's an example of kind of what I was talking about when I said loss of utility. I mean, here's a billboard in the middle of the desert without a message, you know, and kind of, it's sort of, uh, to me, it's a sort of sad thing. It has nothing to say, you know, out there in the middle of nowhere. Um, this was in Scotland, not that it matters. Uh, I don't put locations on my pictures because to me they're, that's kind of irrelevant. Um, shot it from a really low angle so that they've got this kind of square. I mean, this is, I shot a whole roll of this, and this is again a lucky accident of 
you know, shooting over and over again at a 500th of a second, but you've got this kind of square shape in the middle, kind of almost flying off the, the surface of the picture. Um, film infrared, this looks like, I put this in because it reminds me of one of, of your, uh, your rocks around Hyderabad, um, although this was in uh, the um, Joshua Tree National Park in, in Southern California, which uh, since you're from Hyderabad and have all those rocks, you might want to check out if you're ever in the U.S. Very, very much the same kind of landscape. Um, but digital infrared, uh, I mean, rather film infrared, uh, two things about it made it really special. One was um, it had this sort of crystal, crystalline <coughs> granularity, uh, you know, very prominent grain. And also, um, the film itself is white. You know, most black and white film um, is gray. Uh, and uh, it's gray because it has a backing on it that keeps light from spreading out when it strikes the film, particularly highlights. And, but with the infrared film, it was white. And so when highlights struck the film, they would just fog out. So you would get these halos around lighter things. Now, of course, now this was grass. Uh, um, uh, anything organic reflects a lot of infrared, so it turns out fairly light uh, on the film. Um, infrared in overcast conditions, it can work. Uh, it's funny, the curator of prints and drawings at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston bought this picture from me, uh, but he basically dismissed all my other work because it looked too infrared to him. So there's definitely this curatorial prejudice that was happening uh, against infrared, and it's, it persists to this day, I find. And partly it's because uh, people, people who use infrared tend to use it in, you know, for its most obvious effects, dark skies, glowing foliage, um, uh, sort of an almost an instant surrealism. And I don't want to use it in that sort of obvious way, but unfortunately, it has a bad, its bad reputation precedes me when it comes to, you know, showing this work to curators or whatever. So this was from the first bunch of pictures that I did with digital infrared. This was with a Fuji camera that was specifically designed to capture infrared. Um, and uh, what happened, and I still am not really sure um, if it was just because it's easier to shoot a lot in infrared, you know, it, each frame is not as precious as it was with film, infrared film. Developing a role was a pain in the ass, excuse me, and um, because it just was so subject, it was so sensitive. Uh, digital, you could just shoot away. Um, it sort of loosened up the way I shot. I started shooting less, a little less formally, more stuff like this, kind of momentary stuff. Um, you know, moments like this, uh, still, you know, with structure, but, but, um, but you know, I would never have tilted the frame, you know, like this before. It just kind of, it, it sort of loosened me up when I switched to digital infrared, uh, even though I lost those other effects that I was telling you about. Um, you know, I think, interestingly, these pictures, this group of pictures, now that I look back on it as the first digital infrared, I, did, I mean, I see the difference. I'm, you know, I think there are a few good pictures in here, but I don't think they're as mysterious as the film pictures, film infrared pictures that I did. They, there's less mystery to them, and that may make them less good. Um, I don't know, I still haven't really come to a conclusion about that. This I just threw in, it's a quick, it was one of the last things I did with infrared film, and it wasn't even with the film that I used for most, most of my uh, kind of formal portraits. And so I, uh, where did that come from? Okay. Um, so I did a series of pictures of photographers at work, kind of a, so, you know, this was a very uh, specific kind of almost content-driven uh, project by my standards. And I was playing with, you know, very shallow focus and that sort of thing. A little miniature groom there. Um, and then, uh, then I got a real, I converted a digital SLR, um, specifically for infrared photography, you know, you can send your old DSLR to a, one of these cameras that goes in, 
companies rather, that goes in and removes the low pass filter from on top of the sensor and allows the sensor to record all of this infrared light. But the other thing that digital, as I mentioned, kind of did for me is it started making me think, well, I'll shoot a little more pure nature. Um, I guess because it just let me, I felt I could try different things. But in, even when I was doing nature stuff like this, I found you know myself attracted to uh, sort of structures in, here, in nature here, this arch formed by the, the bending saplings, or in this case, this sort of ladder formed by these fallen trees. Um, these were done, these pictures were actually done uh, on an, for, during a two week internship that John, John Isaac and I had at Isle Royal National Park, which is the smallest and least visited national park in, in America. It's a, on an island that's in the far west of Lake Superior, which is the biggest of the Great Lakes. And uh, they basically gave us a cabin with no electricity, no running water, so we had to haul our water up from the lake every day and pour it into a big filter. And uh, you know, we had little gas lamps and we had a canoe. And uh, we paddled all over the island uh, taking pictures. I should say I paddled because John claimed he didn't know how to paddle. And so he was just my weight in the front of the canoe uh, as I, you know, because you need, you need to have weight in the front of the canoe to control the control it and I paddled around while John took pictures of loons and other things like that. But one thing that this island is famous for is having a, a in fact there's a, an over a 50 year study ongoing um, about the, the sort of dynamic between the wolf and the moose populations. In other words the wolves eat the moose, the moose population diminishes there's less food, the wolves rebound, and so forth. And at the time we were there, um, the wolf population was very low, and I figured I probably wouldn't see any wolves at all. Um, so what I did was I cut these big, life-size wolf uh, shapes out of cloth, black cloth, and I would place them in various places around, you know, the island, set, you know, natural settings. Um, and to me, it was sort of the concept was the the absence of wolf, you know, kind of the, the you know, the kind of uh, sort of a negative wolf, fallen wolf, whatever. Um, it was a, a conceptual, a very conceptual thing for me, uh, kind of a departure, and, and frankly, I don't think it works. Um, I showed these to park visitors, that was part of our deal when we did this internship, um, but uh, I, I don't really like them. But, you know, I put, I'm putting them in, in here because it makes the, what I think is an important point about, you know, pursuing something artistically and maybe even, you know, doing photojournalism, whatever, is that you're going to fail. And, you know, failure is a part of the process. Uh, you're going to try things and they're not going to work and you need to just move on and learn from them and uh, you'll make other good work. Um, you know, it's such a careerist world in photography today, you know, where it planned. These were uh, what are called fish camps down in the very southern part of Louisiana. Uh, basically, places where you go to fish for a week and they'll put you up and feed you and everything. And they're all sort of defended by these crazy gates. Uh, so I photographed a whole bunch of these gates, you know, going from camp to camp. And at one point I realized that there was a guy in a pickup truck following me with a big dog. And uh, he pulled up beside and said, why are you photographing my camp? And I said, I, well, I just like the, the gate, you know, or something. I mean, if, if I told him I was from New York, he probably would have shot me. But, um, but uh, I convinced him that my intentions were, you know, innocent. Um, but it's just such a funny uh, kind of declaration of privacy in the middle of this very, very strange and, and kind of um, watery landscape. Uh, another duck blind. Uh, that's a big um, uh, cypress tree. You know, white foliage, that's kind of the traditional infrared effect. Um, Sometimes I, it's hard for me to put a picture like this in the mix just because I've gone for the obvious. Um, 
for this. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it's irresistible. Um, the other way I've been using the digital infrared, and it, it's sort of an example of how really in a way versatile it is as a medium, um, is uh, uh, these more, more detailed images. I mean, it, it's sort of, um, it's sort of also because the, gosh, the quality of the, the digital capture is so amazingly sharp. Um, it's kind of opened up the possibility of doing more uh, detailed kinds of images. Um, and, um, uh, and then, you know, I convert them to black and white, and, and for some reason I get this really nice, long, delicate tonal scale, which John, John when he looks at it, thinks that looks, you know, he says, wow, that looks like a platinum print. Um, this, was, this was actually a, uh, some, an abandoned house that had belonged to a guy who essentially created this monument, sort of religious monument to uh, his wife, um, completely unattended. This was a cemetery down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where they'd put asphalt shingles on the, on the ground. Um, this was on John and my trip to Mississippi. This was um, the foundation of an old commissary where actually the guitarist, uh, Mud, you know, Muddy Waters, learned to play the guitar. Um, greenhouse. Um, so yeah, I, I've been doing these more complex scenes with digital infrared. Um, still not sure they work, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out. But even with these scenes, as you can see, I'm, I'm kind of going for kind of structural elements like this kind of tangle of um, of uh, vines on the left, you know, or these two, uh, these are two, um, what do you call them, uh, uh, grain silos uh, right on the Mississippi, right along the Mississippi that have been kind of overgrown with, uh, uh, you know, with parasitic vines. And, uh, you know, the reason, and the, 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 fold, the, the leaves of the vines are light because of the infrared capture. So I'm almost done, but I'm just gonna show you um, a few color examples, if that's okay. Um, and one other body of work, and then, then I'll let you go. I never liked the quality of color infrared film, which people did use back in the day. Uh, it was just too, too unreal. It was just complete, the color in it was completely false. Whereas the color in digital infrared capture is not. I don't know, I can't explain the difference technically. Uh, you do get this orangey sky, you know, for the most part, although you can actually go in with Photoshop and reverse the, basically reverse the tone so you get a blue sky and kind of gold foliage, but uh, even though it's a, maybe a prettier effect, I just, I just don't, I just don't like the way it looks, so I tend to stick with the orange sky, which, which is a limiting factor, um, you, because, you know, I, I, you can't make pictures that only have orange skies. But uh, this was a, um, a tree of roosting ibises in a small uh, bird sanctuary in Florida. In fact, this is John's favorite place in the world to photograph birds because there are just so many in a small area just flying every which way. Uh, it's, it's like a bird photographer's paradise. And this was taken you know, really late in the day. I mean, the sun had gone down. Uh, kind of picture, I wouldn't have made this picture with digital infrared film, I mean with infrared film, um, because it just, it just couldn't have captured any detail uh, once the sun, you know, was out of the picture. Same thing here. And this, uh, this was kind of an amazing picture for me to uh, do because it, it just, uh, it was a reflection and it was, the reflection itself was quite dark. I wonder if I have the, well, this is a slightly different example, but it gives you the, the idea. This is, the, this has been white balanced out of the camera, but no work done on it. And then this is after Photoshop. Um, and, uh, hold on, did I open that up? There we go. Um, and I've gone in with a, these Nick filters and pulled out all the detail in the, um, you can see how much sort of it's, things have picked up in the, uh, 
Photoshop version. It just, just allows you to pull all of this detail out of the, you know, out of the muck of that image, you know, down there. Um, so, you know, the level of control that digital gives you compared to the film days is, here, here's one I ruined. Uh, here is what I, oh no, I'm sorry, that's the, here's what I did, what I ended up doing in color. And here is what it looked like before. I, f I completely fucked it up, excuse me, but you know, um, this just has a much more delicate quality uh, than what I ended up, you know, getting after spending an hour manipulating it. Um, okay, and then in this case, I pulled out a tremendous amount of uh, detail uh, from the water. Um, it's all there, particularly if you shoot raw. These were uh, cypresses in a swamp. That's back at the same sanctuary where the other picture was taken. Um, this is near that, this is actually near a beautiful uh, state park in central Florida that John and I went to. Um, these are cypress knees, which are the way cypress trees propagate themselves. Um, another case of pulling I mean, I was able to pull massive amounts of detail out of that reflection that just weren't there in the straight capture. <clears throat> um, these were all made, this is an example of how different uh, you, in the, you know, the quality of, uh, of infrared capture can be. You know, you can get something like this, get something like that. Um, I'm not sure I like this, even though it's probably the more dramatic and the more accessible of the two pictures. Um, this is more sort of to my liking. Uh, I like the delicacy of it, but you know, that's personal. Um, I don't like this picture. <laughs> um, I don't like this picture. Uh, I don't like this picture. Um, this picture I do like, because it's a little bit kind of like an impressionist thing, even though it doesn't have much structure to it. This is, these are just a few pictures to show that I did shoot color before. These were done back when Polaroid introduced its 35 millimeter instant slide films, and I, they gave me a bunch to go travel and shoot with to use so that they could use the pictures for introducing the film. And the film had a, had a it's an additive process. In other words, it had a little, these little, this little grid of, of red, green, and blue filters on top of a black and white transparency, basically. Uh, and the problem, the problem, in a sense, was that you could always see the grid. I tried to make prints, analog prints, um, you know, uh, color, conventional color C prints from these pictures. I made enlarged 8 by 10 negatives. I mean, I just went, like, went crazy trying to do it. They never turned out to my satisfaction. The grid was always visible. Digital came along, and I went back to the same image, I, images, I added some digital noise, and suddenly the grid was gone. In other words, it didn't look like a TV picture anymore. Just another case of digital kind of coming to the rescue. Um, but, you know, the, the, these were pictures that I did basically on assignment, but I ended up, ended up liking them because they have an almost kind of pointillist painterly quality. Uh, but I still, I'm still not comfortable with color. Uh, I'm, I don't know that I'm a good color photographer. Um, uh, I'm still trying to understand it. Um, I think it's very complicated. Uh, I'm still much more comfortable with black and white. These are just, I'm through, throw these in as another example of, you know, how I basically stopped making consistent pictures. You know, you're sort of told to make pictures that are all very similar to each other. I'm completely ignoring that sort of commandment um, and trying a lot of different things. Um, and these were pictures that I did by taking a little so-called microscope point shoot camera and doing little panoramas, you know, multiple frame panoramas of crazy assemblages of stuff in my basement. And then I would stitch them together in the software, whether it was Photoshop or some other, would always get confused about how to stitch them together and to just do crazy things. And I made these because, number one, I wanted to work in color. Um, number two, frankly, I was trying to produce something that I thought maybe I could sell in New York, you know, because uh, they were a little bit more along the lines of what was going on 
you know, in contemporary photography. And they were big and bright, big prints, panoramas, bright colors. I, I found, I bought a collection of old bugs and used those too. Uh, but um, I don't know, I don't think they work either. Um, and then this is just the last thing I'll tell you. This, this project was a total departure for me. Um, it was probably the most documentary work I've ever done. Um, and uh, also the most personal work I've ever done, which is, sounds weird because how could the most documentary work you've ever done also be the most personal? Isn't documentary work about what's out there? Well, these were... Um, I had to move my mom out of her house because she was sort of losing her marbles and now she pretty much can't communicate. Uh, but I had the task, which took me almost a year, of clearing out her house um, so I could sell it. And it was, I had to do it all by myself. My sisters didn't, didn't pitch in and it was a very solitary and maybe the saddest thing I've ever had to do. And when I started Going through everything, I found these weird little trays of sort of related items that my mother had left, had, had created as kind of an organizational tool because she was basically obsessive compulsive um, and would label everything and annotate everything. And you know, she made these little, this was all, this had some, used some, str some string, uh, you know, clothesline string that she was saving and something else and keys that she didn't know what they went to anymore, but she was afraid to throw them away. Um, and she made, she's sort of self-aware here, she says, like string too short to be saved there in the middle. I started to shoot, this is her desk as I found it. Um, I started to photograph these, well I, I was photographing both the interior of the house as I sort of emptied it out, and also um, these little crazy little trays that she was making like this one where she saved the band from some underwear to use as an elastic to wrap around something. I guess I see it as a portrait, uh, sort, sort of a portrait of her, uh, even though it's not, you know, it's not of her, but it's of something she created. Uh, and, um, it, you know, because she has Alzheimer's, it's, if you, you know, if you kind of read the notes that go with it, you sort of understand that it's a study of sort of the memories of someone who, you know, if I gave this box to her now, she wouldn't know what, it, what any of the stuff was, even if she read, even if she could read the, the annotations. So these are little, almost little memory shrines, I guess you could say, that she had left behind. I shot these by window light with a copy stand. I was very curious. I did, bracketed exposures, I used, believe it or not, I used HDR uh, because I wanted to create a very delicate tonal scale. You know, now we tend to think of HDR as a, this device for special effects and everything, um, and it's overused that way, but, you know, when used properly, it's a great tool for controlling contrast and tonality and, and so forth. She saved zippers, by the way, <laughs> um, and made little paper packing things, and um, these are my sister's dolls. Um, those are my father's ties. Even he had been, he had died almost 15 years, well, 12 years before. Uh, but, all, you know, his stuff was mostly around the house still. Um, this was the part of the living room. You know, souvenir rocks. <laughs> uh, I made that little that's a little bookmark thing, that little leather thing when I was in summer camp when I was probably five, you know. Um, no, no, these, she saved some uh, shoelaces. These are 34 and a half inches too short, you know. Um, and saved bottles of codeine that are, you know, 25 years out of date and all of the lapel pins she ever had. Um, <clears throat> leashed to a dog that died in 1972. <laughs> I had to move her downstairs, so basically her bedroom was in the dining room, you know, so that she could be on one floor. This was her 
not her main refrigerator, but her freezer, which was, which I defrosted actually after I took this picture. <laughs> This was actually something my grandmother left behind, so clearly this is, this is hereditary. I'm a little afraid. <laughs> so. This was a bird's nest that birds built in a Christmas wreath on the front door. Uh, we couldn't use the front door for like two months, and then when they had, you know, they had left. She saved the nest and wrapped it up and put it in this little box. Pine cones for like decorations, you know. These are little flower baskets. Clothing pattern. Some of these are in the, the show, which is on the top floor of the, you know, the main building. Um, and, um, you know, printed by, uh, by the, is it the Rajan School of Photography? I have to say they did a phenomenal job. Uh, Ramana, um, Rajan Babu, I'm sorry, I'm not completely good with Indian names, but um, uh, considering that they printed over 700 images in the space of eight days or something like that. Uh, I was just floored by the quality of the, of the, of the prints. I mean, I still, I, and if anyone's interested, I can show you that my prints are still a little better, I think, but given that they had no reference, uh, no hard copy reference, uh, they really just, they did an amazing job. These are just the last few here. Uh, it's a project that I might actually do when John and I go to Rampambor, photograph the tigers. I, I have a magnifying glass that I had when I was a kid, and it would always intrigue me that with a magnifying glass you can you use it as a lens, basically to form an image. I mean, in addition to using it to burn ants and things like that, or leaves, start fires and leaves, um, you can actually form an image. You know, if you're inside, you take the magnifying glass and there's a window over there, you can move it back and forth until you get an image of the window on your hand or paper or whatever. And this particular magnifying glass has a focal length of about 375 millimeters, so it's a good wildlife lens. But of course, it's a magnifying glass, so it's not very sharp. And uh, so my idea was to do basically soft focus wildlife pictures. You, and in order to do it, I had to create this crazy, uh, you know, I had to take two extension bellows and hook them together with something else. So when I've gone to the zoo with this thing, people look at it, you know, sort of sideways because they can't figure out what, what it is because it's this very long tubular uh, thing. But, um, uh, you know, it produces very soft effect and I have to sharpen it a lot even to get it. Uh, to this point, um, but that's sort of what I'm after. I mean, again, I'm not interested in doing conventional wildlife pictures. I love them, but I don't want to do them. And so this was my way of maybe doing wildlife pictures that, that fit into some, that were sort of consistent, you know, with my own, um, you know, photographic uh, intent. And that's all I got. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I think a series of your mother is incredibly powerful. I think it's the strongest piece. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I, I took um, a bunch of work to, uh, I don't know if you know the Griffin Museum in, Bo in Boston. And they liked some of the other work, but that work, they said, we want to show this work. Now, I hope they do. I haven't heard back from them. Yeah, but. that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Because um, I think it's very intimate. I think it's very strong. And I just think when, when you said it's the first one, you did this sort of quasi-documentary piece, I think that's kind of your calling. Really? Yeah. 
Not yet. Um, I mean, it, to, I, I did submit it actually to. You, do you know the the Duke, the Hanekman Book Prize? I don't know if you know. It's a, it's a it's called the first book prize um, because to me it sort of uh, would lend itself to a book format. Um, yeah. I mean, even though the even though with those tray pictures actually the big they're good as big prints because they're very readable. You can see every little detail. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So documentary is my calling. Wow. I think it is. I think for, for me that was just so powerful. I saw it on your show yeah. and it really mm -hmm. resonated with me. We were both looking at yeah. it and saying, mm -hmm. wow, this is incredible. I mean, how would I, um, but where would I go from there? I mean, that was a very specific sort of opportunity. Uh, I mean, I mean, I did documentary photography when I freelanced years ago. Uh, but I never thought I was very good at it. And this was a very particular, personal I think sort of it has to be something you're passionate about. Yeah. I'm curious about how emotional it is. So I think it's got to be something that you're really inspired by. Mm -hmm. there, there was an amazing project done by an aid worker in Sudan where she was photographed the shoes and sandals that mm -hmm. refugees wore if they came across. Mm -hmm. She has this whole body of work because they're still lives of the sandals. Mm -hmm. Things to represent yeah, people, sort like, of. Like, you know, Donald Weather has an interesting take, interesting take. But for some of the, he's amazing. Yeah. Uh, for some of the things he does, so if only his project now is called like War Group or something like that, where he collects dirt from fields of battle, like the Living Mormon Indian collector, and mm -hmm. takes these like microscopic images of dirt instead of wow. I mean, that's pretty high concept, but yeah. Concept, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, during, during the battle of the, you know, not the Great Lakes, but during the battle of the, whatever. He, he has like this, he set up actually in the middle of the huge young battle, he set up a seamless on the side of the mm -hmm. wall where there's no ricochet, and he took portraits of people on the, on the top of the mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there are check ways it out. to, Behind what? What is the idea behind seeing his own world in infrared, through infrared? Um, well, I don't think there's an idea behind it except that it, it gave me a set of tools to interpret or reinterpret reality or, or you know, to represent reality in ways different than, you know, normal film or normal di digital capture would have, you know, in other words, you know, inverting some of the tonal relationships, um, you know, with the film causing a glow. I mean, it was just a tool set. It was just another tool set that was not realistic because, like I said, I didn't want to do realistic pictures. Um, but, you know, some of these pictures probably could have been made with, um, you know, conventional film. 
I don't know if they would have been as good, but um, uh, so yeah, it's not that infrared is any kind of revelation in and of itself. It's just a, another tool set. You know. Which which uh, digital uh, converted uh, infrared camera are you using? You got it converted? Or yeah, you know? it's a D six hundred Nikon D six hundred. I did use a Fuji. There was a Fuji model called the Fuji UVIR. It was that de dedicated uh, IR camera. I did. I also did have recently another. Uh, Nikon converted uh, to a different infrared filter that's more like the earlier work I did. It's a stronger kind of uh, more dramatic effect and I've just, I, this is the first time I've used it. I brought it here and I'm not sure I like it actually, but we'll see, you know. this could work and then there was some reason that it and I can't remember what it's it was but that may have been it yeah it was just really <laughs> expensive yeah that's, that's a good reason yeah yeah, yeah I remember when that uh, was announced yeah I, I was pretty intrigued by that yeah yeah because it's not a large market no you kind of go, well, hmm, how many people are going to buy that? yeah 